Okay, so I'm here with Chris Hammond from Experian. We're going to have a chat today about just careers, um, his role at the moment, what he does, how he got to where he where he is now, and then hopefully some advice that you might be able to pick up and use yourselves going forward in your career. So I'll start you off with a really easy one, Chris. What's your job title or job role and what does that involve? Uh, so officially, I am a senior operational risk manager uh, within Experian. Um, for, for those of you that aren't aware, um, Experian are a officially known as a credit reference agency uh, in a nutshell was kind of specialists in data analytics and various bits of technology and a lot of the work that we do um, underpins some of the major financial decisions that people take in life whether it's applying for mortgages car loans credit cards um, anything of that nature um, I think that the main role uh, of my job is to support the business in identifying risks uh, and then once they've been identified putting in um, place measures to try and um, stop those risks from occurring um, I think a real basic example um, in practical terms is um, everybody has objectives so for example at the moment with lockdown and covid um, my main objective when all this is over is to get out there on holiday um, and there are certain threats that were, are going to prevent me from doing that. So an airline could go bust. I, I could get food poisoning. I could lose my luggage. And once you've been through and identified those individual threats, you look at, okay, what can we do to stop those from happening and make sure that we get to where we want to go? Yeah. And that's where you look at things like your travel insurance, taking along medication, um, paying for things on your credit card so you, you're covered in the event that an airline fails or, or whatnot. Um, so it's working with the different, different business units. They've all got different objectives um, and just trying to put a bit of a framework and structure in place to help them achieve those objectives with as little drag um, and as few bumps in the road as possible. Um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, day to day, um, it probably doesn't quite sound as exciting as that. Um, so everybody's working from home at the moment, camped out in my uh, conservatory, uh, which is great through the summer months when it's red hot less so in the winter um, glued to my screens for seven or eight hours a day dependent on what point I remember that it's I've got kids that need feeding and <laughs> chores that need doing um, majority of the day so the, the early part of the day I tend to assign to my um, individual tasks so it's not one of those roles where you kind of come in and process um, like widgets on a day-to-day -day basis I don't have a set number of calls or emails that I need to answer and um, the more kind of strategic based um, projects that I'm working on so delivering training and guidance to the business and determining what that should look like and um, arranging risk workshops etc so the mornings when I tend to do a lot of my work because um, that's when I'm most awake um, and there's more chance of me getting it done. Uh, and then from about lunchtime onwards, that's when the, uh, the, the less attractive stuff comes in. So it's re usually replying to a barrage of emails from people out in the business, um, Zoom calls, WebExes coming out of my ears at times. Um, and then, yeah, just general phone calls from sort of my key stakeholders within the business. Um, and that's pretty much, I think, how, how most of the days are going at the moment. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people in different industries that recognise some of those kind of patterns that are emerging these days in, in terms of, you know, work-life balance and things like that. And as you know, you mentioned kind of fitting the home life into the work life, which has almost become the same thing now for a lot of people. That's right. That's right. So, so just to kind of tell us a little bit of, you know, context about, you know, what you do in, in the, in terms of the way the whole organisation fits together. Can you tell me a bit about how your department fits in with the others and what other roles and kind of jobs there are that the other people do in the company? Uh, whew, yeah, I mean, the experience quite a large organisation. So I think within Nottingham, um, we've got three offices, um, two or three, I think we may have closed one recently, um, located all over the UK and all over the globe. Um, so the risk team that I'm part of fits in with a, um, a broader, almost like a, a governance risk and compliance department, if you like. So we have the compliance guys who are primarily focused on making sure that we um, do what we should be doing uh, and remain compliant with some laws that you've probably heard of. So GDPR, um, that's one of the main ones. That's the reason why every website you go on at the moment, you get a little box popping up asking if they can have your consent for storing cookies and stuff like that. So anything that we do that impacts a consumer, um, we've also got to make sure that we're working within the confines of the um, financial conduct authority as well. 
Um, we have a legal team um, that, again, pretty similar, but they're making sure that we work within the confines of the law. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a few other teams as well that look at things like business continuity, um, which business continuity is one of these strange things. We call them, it's like a, a black swan. Um, you don't see one for years upon years. And then all of a sudden something comes along and it's the thing that you didn't expect to happen actually happens. So, and so a prime example this year has been COVID. So we've been working with the business continuity teams a lot on that. Um, and they look at things like, okay, people can't get into the office. How do we still work? How do we still deliver products to our clients? How do we ensure that consumers can still access um, products using our software and data, et cetera? So that's the department. Um, in terms of the wider organization, we have teams that do everything. Um, probably the most interesting stuff is the things that we do with data. So we collect a hell of a lot of data with con- from consumers and from clients. Um, and it's all about how we can use that data for good. So you will potentially have recently seen on the news um, or TV adverts, we've just launched a product called Boost. Uh, and this now gives people um, just, just standard consumers, it gives them the ability to tap into their banking data. So historically on your credit report, you'll have things like if you're on the electoral roll, any loans or credit cards that you've taken out, but it never had any information to do with your Netflix subscriptions, for example. Um, so now we're opening up that data and people are seeing a positive hit to their credit report as a result, which is then enabling them to take that first step onto the housing ladder. So there's plenty of opportunities to get involved in new product launches like that. Um, and again, some of the some of the data analytics stuff, it's way, way, way over my head. Um, but a lot of the stuff when you speak to the guys, it's fascinating. The, the the stuff that they can do um that's probably the most interesting stuff and then there's of course there's other departments so you've got the likes of human resources um finance if, if you're into number crunching um and most of the other departments that you'll see within sort of many any major organization and definitely within a, a FTSE 100 listed company yeah okay so that's really interesting so as you mentioned although some people will possibly be aware of what the company does and will have seen it up in lights you know in in nottingham it's interesting to see that under that roof there's so many different things going on so many different roles and you know i think sometimes when you're younger and you look at those sort of larger companies that you know are national or international you think well what actually goes on behind those doors and what sort of roles are available is it all just number crunching is it all just data but obviously there's lots of things going on and it's about you know knowing that you fit into you know a big puzzle as a little piece i suppose and yeah. but also knowing that those things have all, all got you know value as well so ju- just i mean we've touched on a little bit about you know what your average day looks like um, and i'd be interested to hear from you know from your point of view sort of pre and and then post kind of covid in the world that we're in at the moment has anything changed for you in terms of the way that you're having to sort of schedule your days massively? You know, were you going into the office an awful lot beforehand or, uh, you know, is that something that's not changed too much for you? And how has that affected the way the company functions? Has it ha- had a major impact overall on what you do? And has it, um, ha- have you noticed anything sort of in the culture of the company that's changed as well? Yeah, so I think pre-COVID, I'm um, I'm officially a flexible worker anyway. Um, so I was only going into the office maybe one or two days a week. Um, I actually live, as you can tell, live up north, just south of Manchester. Um, so I was commuting to Nottingham for a day or two. Um, and then obviously post-COVID now, everybody's just working from home. Um, the company's been really great with everybody and said, unless, unless there is a burning desire from anybody to go into the office, then... Mm-hmm. If you're quite happy to work from home and you've got the ability to then then stick with it um i think that the main thing that we noticed from a kind of partially on the a cultural side of things but um the, the company have been like i said the company have been great there have been regular surveys to kind of assess um physical um setups of staff to make sure that they're kind of still meeting health and safety requirements but also the mental aspect of it as well and just mm-hmm. checking in with people uh, we have like a, a weekly pulse survey that kind of just it's all anonymous so you can tell people how you're feeling and stuff and i think that the output of that has been really positive positive. Oh. and um, one of the key things i did notice was that as, a, as an organization we've been um positivity uh, positivity um productivity's gone through the roof um and we really felt that i think in the first couple of months um and i don't know if it was the fact that people were at home um, and they were, they were obviously they'd lost that commuting time. So they were potentially working earlier and then working later. Um, but it, it, it almost became a bit of a negative 
um, at some point because people were just working constantly because it was just so accessible. And as a result, then everybody else was working a lot as well. So we've kind of had to put the um, put the brakes on that a bit and just make sure that people people are taking holidays because <laughs> that was the other thing that kind of fell by the wayside as well. So um, I think, yeah, it's brought its challenges. Um, it, I mean, again, it's also opened up possibilities and opportunities going forward as well. Um, I think one of the questions everybody's asking at the moment is, do we ever need to go back into an office? And what are the implications of that? And um, there hasn't been a single thing working from home that I haven't been able to do, which I would have been able to do in the office. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting how that develops. I think um, we've kind of proved that it works. Um, like I say, everybody's still being productive. We're still launching new products. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting on how that develops. Yeah, it's definitely a topic of debate at the moment that I think a lot of the larger companies, you know, we, we saw very early on in lockdown companies, you know, in terms of the social media stuff, companies like Twitter and Facebook saying that all of their employees can now work from home for the rest of the time, basically, unless they yeah. really want to go into the office. And I know that, you know, with my team at the college and a lot of the, you know, the back office teams at the college, we have been working, you know, from home in, in the main. Um, and it's about finding that balance, isn't it, going forward is, Although, you know, it's great to sometimes be more productive and lose that commuting time for a lot of people is fantastic. And obviously there's more time than to spend at home with kids or, or you know, yeah. family or whatever it is. But it's about having that balance of knowing that still you have to start at, you know, a reasonable time, finish at a reasonable time, make sure you put time in for lunch yeah. and all of those things. And also, I think those conversations that people sometimes had in the office about, you know, what did you watch on telly last night? What did you do over the weekend? These conversations, you know, with people about, you know, football or, or you know, sport or whatever it is. Yeah. But sometimes people aren't having those now. And almost you have to compensate for that by actually just planning time and to have those social conversations. So we've, we've done exactly that. Yeah, we've, we've made a conscious effort. So um, one once a week for, I think, a half an hour or an hour on Thursday mornings, we just get together as a team. I mean, the team's only small anyway. So there's four of us uh, and we just get to talk get together and talk the one rule is we don't talk about work um which by and large we are there too but yeah it's exactly that i think that the one thing that we do lack is just that ability to stand up and shout across the room a question directly at somebody and whereas now it's kind of you, you've got to schedule time in your diary and see if they're free and i think that's yeah you, as a result you, you your diary is just full of meetings where it would just be a, I'm just going to wander over and speak to Dan or speak yeah. to Lisa and find out what their opinion is. I think that that for me is probably, it doesn't sound a lot, but that's the biggest drawback, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. And I think that's something that obviously, you know, companies were looking to maybe start working that way at some point. And then, you know, at the end of March this year, there was just that sort of, the switch was flicked overnight where everybody was just yeah. running that experiment very quickly. And obviously you've got the associated IT issues and everything. So I think we're trying to catch up with that quickly, but I think it's good for learners to hear that, I think what, you know, positives I can see looking forward is that, you know, it's not necessary that now you have to sort of live really close to the company you work for, because if you can work from home, you can almost work from anywhere. So yeah. maybe there'll be, you know, a bit more scope for working internationally with companies that are based abroad or in different parts yeah. of the country. So I think in some ways where it's closed off, you know, some doors, I think it definitely will open opportunities in some others. So I think it's definitely the, the message for, for students is that it's not really, you know, in some ways it is going to increase opportunities where maybe it looks like they're decreasing elsewhere. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that, that, again, that's part of the role that we do as, as risk managers, where, where one, pe one person sees a risk or a threat. It's our job to kind of challenge the perceptions and say, OK, it's going to take away this thing. But what are the opportunities? And like you say, we're currently recruiting for various roles and we've now just we've lost the location um, anchor. So if somebody's based in London or they're based in Glasgow and they've got the qualifications and the experience, then we'd, we'd be stupid not to consider it. So we've had a few people that have started looking, who employed at Experian, who are now thinking, well, if I don't need to commute, then I could work abroad. Like they, they've been looking at properties in Spain or Italy and with a anywhere with a Wi-Fi connection, you can just log on, do your work and enjoy slightly better weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, great. So we just step back a little bit then, Chris, and go back in time a little bit. Yep. We, can you tell us a bit about how you got to where you are now in terms of uh, your, your, you know, sort of progression of career? So any previous roles you might have had, any qualifications yeah. you did in the past, and maybe, um, you know, just tell us a little bit about your school and background as well. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so, so if you ever meet a risk manager who tells you they deliberately became a risk manager, then I can, they're lying. Um, everybody kind of falls into it by accident. Um, so I suppose my, my route here, um, so I left school at 15 um, with um, a few GCSEs under my belt and went straight down the uh, modern apprenticeship route. Um, so I did probably three or four years um, essentially as a office helper or administrator um loads of photocopying answering phones um working my way up it was a sort of small family run organization um i think after about seven or eight years they started getting into sort of a few financial difficulties um a friend i knew worked for a corporate bank in manchester city center so he got me on kind of one of the low rungs of the ladder there uh, within one of the banking teams um, I was there for about four years, and during that time, I sort of undertook my first proper qualification um, to do with securities and um, financial derivatives, etc. Uh, and one of the modules within that was um, you had a selection of about eight to choose from, and for some reason, I chose operational risk. Um, did the module, passed it, and I don't know, something just clicked, and I thought, do you know what, this actually sounds quite interesting. Um, and it just so happened that a couple of months later, um, a company opened up offices over the road from us. Um, they were advertising for some operational risk analysts. <laughs> so for, I, I don't know why I did it, but I applied, um, managed to genuinely blag my way through an interview um, and then got the call saying that I'd got the job. Um, turned up on the first day with no experience, no real knowledge because it was like an introductory exam I'd taken. Um, uh, and just bags of enthusiasm so it was a very very steep learning curve um, I think I turned up to work on the Tuesday uh, and on the Thursday I was told that I was going down to London to conduct my first uh, risk workshop which was uh, terrifying um, it wasn't even exciting it was just pure terror um, and then the company again the company were great and paid for a, a load of training so there was a certificate um, ran by the IRM, which is the Institute of Risk Managers in the UK. Um, so I did the certificate qualification there. Um, that was, I think, over the course of 18 months or so. Um, that gave me the foundation knowledge that I needed to sort of do my role. And then it was just a case of learning on the job and applying that theory in practice. Um, and then after a couple of years, um, upgraded to, the, to begin the diploma, uh, again, through the IRM. IRM. Uh, and that's essentially, I think it's... Uh, um, master's equivalent um, qualification um, and it's kind of the gold standard if you like if people are recruiting and they see that you've got that on your CV um, then they'll look on it favorably um, so that was a I think it was a four-year undertaking which I only finished uh, March last year and um, the last module on that so only recently qualified at the age of 36 um, and then yeah moved to Experian March last year um again that was sort of helped a bit so i knew my the manager that i was going to be working for at experian and um, i'd worked with her previously and um, thought that was a good fit for the role um wasn't really looking to move and um, but i thought out of respect for her I'll, I'll come and have a look around and um, get the interview and then uh, it always happens when, once you've had your head turned you think actually i could see myself working here um i was then just waiting for the phone call and eventually came so uh, that's where i've been for the last 18 months or so great okay so there are definitely some good messages in there so first of all i think you know definitely about having an open mind and what it is you end up doing because as you said at the beginning there you know there are certain roles that that people might think well how did you get into that and often it is that you you've kind of fallen into it because you might leave school and not even be aware that you know such a role exists but actually yeah. as you work through a company and you start to see these things i think oh what is what actually is that that sounds like it could be interesting and then you go to do it so I think, you know, also you mentioned in there about, I think, you know, in terms of your enthusiasm and attitude, it's definitely something that, you know, is worth definitely trying to set, you know, sell that if that's something that you feel like you've got. Yeah. Because sometimes I know this, you know, from the having done previous roles and, and doing recruitment for our team as well, that sometimes it's equally as important as the actual qualifications you've got. Or if you're not quite there in terms of the, the former qualifications, but you've got bags of enthusiasm and you can show that drive and desire and that determination and yeah, the attitude exactly and that. positivity that you bring to a team, employers will always look at that favorably and notice it. It never goes unnoticed in my experience. And I think it can make, definitely make the difference in putting you head and shoulders above somebody else that might even technically be a little bit more qualified on paper. So I think 
you know, for any learners watching this, definitely worth, you know, pushing that if that's something you feel you've got. I think, um, you know, I, I know that there's definitely students that kind of have come to us in the last year or two that are getting there with the qualification side of it, but we know that they're very enthusiastic and positive. So definitely always put that forward and, and really let, let employers know that that's how you feel. Don't, yeah, definitely. don't don't be afraid in, you know, in, in, um, in interviews, if you feel like you need to be a bit more reserved or conservative, you don't need to do that. You can be really positive, obviously up to a point, but we yeah. de definitely encourage. And also, as you, you know, another thing you mentioned is that networking side and contacts. And if you do know people that if that can help you with those things, or if this kind of family or friends that, that work in businesses that can help you, you know, don't be afraid to kind of push on them as well, where it can help. So I think that's definitely something I would recommend too. I know that I've, I've got roles in the past like that as well through friends and, you know, yeah. I've, I've gone from one place to another with people that I know. So definitely all recommended things to do. Never something to turn your nose up at, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, having been involved in the sort of recruitment of various people, I hand on heart, I think technical skills, yes, it's good if you've got them, um, but, nine times out of the ten technical skills you can learn um and you can learn on the job if need be i think for me it's the it's the soft side of things and the soft skills that people bring so yeah if somebody's clamming up in an interview but they can talk to me about all the theory of risk management then that's great but because a lot of the stuff that in most roles you're going to be facing off to key stakeholders and if you haven't got those communication skills and relationship building skills you'll lose a lot of credibility within the business so i think personally i i would always prioritize those and worst case you, you learn the technical stuff later um yeah yeah agree on title yeah absolutely because i think you know these days especially when the workforce is a little bit scattered and as you say you're, you're doing a lot of facetime with people over you know video calling apps and things like that as well the people that you work with and the amount of time you're spending with those people conversing with them it's a lot of the job isn't it you know exactly. i always think the people that you work with is sometimes 80 90 percent of it yeah especially at the moment yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely so i mean as i mentioned to you before we started recording um a lot of our students will be looking to go into employment in the next year or two as they as they you know sort of do the qualification side of things and then leave the college if there were students that were looking to go into your field of work and you know possibly in your specific role because i know a lot of students might not necessarily even be aware of your role up until this point if they were looking to go into this industry or this role, are there any specific tips or advice you would give someone or even things to possibly avoid as well? Um, whew, pressure. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, I had a look at this recently, actually. Um, as it stands today, I don't think there are a, any kind of apprenticeship routes into risk management, although I am aware that they are coming and uh, the organisation, the IRM that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. they're one of the kind of they're at the forefront of trying to get an apprenticeship scheme out there um i think if you were looking to do stuff off your own bat there's wealth of information on the internet again i'd suggest the irm as a, as a good starting point just to kind of get to grips with the, the fundamentals and um, qualifications can be can be quite expensive so i think the certificate is um one or two thousand pounds from from memory um but again there's plenty of information um whether you look at um hm treasuries um i think it's called the orange book or orange guide and um, that will give you a very good introduction and high level overview of what a risk management framework is um i think for for anybody starting out it's just don't be scared of getting on the bottom rung of that ladder um just putting in putting in the hours um one of the biggest things that you could bring to any job even more so in a, a risk manager's role is just having experience of an industry, different industries, um, different teams within an organization. So try and not get yourself stuck in one role and become a, a master of, it sounds really bad, don't become a, a master of one thing, but try and become a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, I don't consider myself a subject matter expertise on anything other than risk, but I would back myself in a room of, say, technology people to be able to get what I need out of them and they can just talk technical jargon for an hour and a half. Um, and I think that just comes from having experience, having worked with technology people before, having worked with financial people before. Everybody talks about the same sort of thing, but they use different terminology and languages. So I think the biggest thing you can do is, is probably build that experience. Um, like I say, whether it's, I don't know, in a fast food restaurant or just in a, in a company printing out leaflets, um, just absorb everything. Um, you, you won't think anything about at the time, but at some point in the future, you'll you'll 
remember it you'll fall back on it and you'll use that to your to your advantage um yeah i think that's that's probably probably it for the moment um yeah, I think, that, I think that's great advice. I mean, that's definitely something that we, we always try and encourage students is if they've got these part time jobs, you know, away from college, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, even even at kind of 16, 17, 18, if you're working in McDonald's or you're working in a shop, sometimes it's difficult if, you, if you've got a really specific career path that you want to go down where you yeah. think, well, this isn't related to what I'm going to do. How is this going to help in the long run? Well, it does because you still have those people skills and interactions. Sometimes it's just learning that kind of empathy of how to be a good listener in conversations with people. And, you know, as you say, knowing how to sort of speak to people in teams and, and understand how to kind of get what you need for, sometimes from, you know, those interactions. And also just understanding the way organisations fit together and as we said earlier on you know understanding that even though you've got a role where it might seem kind of oh this is small and just a link in the chain well actually a lot of those things are integral and if you understand how you fit into a structure you know with the management above you or if you've got people that you supervise there's a lot of transferable skills that you can take into any industry you know I know from I've, I've had you know several various roles in the past and I never thought I'd end up working in education and doing a role like this but there are things from previous roles I've done at companies that were completely different to this that I definitely use day to day in terms of things just like time management diary management you know as you say those technical skills of you know how to be quite savvy with you know emails or calendars especially these days zoom and teams and webex and things like that there are all these things that you pick up that kind of go together and do form something that you know I think it's when you've got those things, piecing them together, knowing how to sell yourself to an employer, because sometimes we take it for granted that we know how to do all of these things, but not, not everybody does. And so if you know that you've got those strings to your bow, it's definitely, a, then it just, it's kind of finding that way of putting your best foot forward, letting an employer know that actually I have all of these skills. And although I've worked in this place that might not be relevant to this role, I've picked up all of these skills and these are the things I can do. These are the things I've accumulated over time. And, you know, this is, and then knowing how to kind of map them onto this, you know, model of this new role. So as you say, there are things that you're not an expert in, but you would back yourself to be able to get the job done in other areas because you're confident in that you've got enough skills to kind of, you know, you mentioned it before, sometimes just sort of blagging it or winging it a little bit. If you can kind of bring enough to the table that I think that's something that, that everyone feels like they're doing sometimes. I know something that comes up a lot recently with interviewing people is this kind of this term imposter syndrome. Yes. People feel like I'm not qualified enough to do this. I don't, you know, maybe I'm not an expert on this. The people around me must know more. They, you know, I'm going to get found out. But often, actually, the enthusiasm and the attitude is a big part of it. And, you know, as you say, a lot of the skills can be learned and kind of improved upon. So, I mean, I guess the last thing I'd really want to ask you on that sort of set of questions is, is there anything so far, and the answer to this may well be no, but is there anything you've done so far in your career that you would do differently if you had the chance over again? Yeah, no. Um, I'm not I'm not one of these people that tends to dwell on um, the past or things that I've done wrong. Um, if anything, if anything, it's quite the opposite. Um, so one of the things that sprang to mind then was whatever whatever you find yourself doing, just just be curious ask the stupid questions because ultimately that's how you're going to learn and like say if you're just i don't know putting putting clothes on a on a shelf in a shop then ask what happens before that get involved understand the supply chain and logistics and like say knowing how that basic flow works will assist you in any organization that you, you go to work from um, one of the things we're trying to work on at the moment uh, with an experience is exactly along these kind of lines in terms of not seeing success and failure as being intrinsically linked and to succeed you must fail and if you look at any of the big organizations or the big sports people and if anybody's watched the um uh, is it save uh, the last dance the michael jordan documentary yeah. you'll yeah. see how successful he was but then he's only that successful because of all his previous failings and trying to change that attitude within a large organization whether it's experian or anyone else to be kind of obs obsess themselves with failure um, mm -hmm. treat every failure as a as a learning opportunity and i think that sort of translates into normal life as well don't spend days weeks months um dwelling over an exam that you failed pick yourself up understand why you failed it and then work to put it right going forward so yeah no regrets on that. no regrets on that front um i think everything that i've done so far in my life has kind of helped me get to where i am today and um, both in work and outside of work um i think probably the only the only regret would not be doing some of that stuff sooner 
um, yeah. not asking the daft questions, um, not being curious enough to to sort of seek out answers and stuff. Yeah. Um, well, that's a, that's a hindsight, isn't it? I think. Yeah. But I mean, you know, luckily, and that, that's why we're trying to do these sort of conversations these days. Is you know don't totally valid for you to say there that you know that you've got no regrets there and I think that's great to hear you know that's kind of my philosophy as well is that even sometimes where things fall down it's about sort of picking the bones out of it and saying what can I learn from that how can I help that progress and the good thing about having this these sort of conversations is that you know for, for the learners to watch is they can benefit from the experience of people like yourself that actually although you know at some point in you know in my academic career i might fail an exam or i might not get that job that i go for but you know what can you learn from that how can you help it improve you as a person how can you use that in a positive way and learn from those mistakes and kind of you know use them to to kind of improve even just your understanding of the way you know the world of employment works that I didn't get this particular role, you know, is that because I wasn't up to a certain standard or I needed to push a certain element of myself or I just wasn't quite, you know, at the right stage at that time and maybe I'll come back to it and try again later on. So I think, you know, as you say, to a certain degree that, that, you know, there are these failures, but it's how you kind of frame them and look at them and what your attitude is towards them. I know that um, recently I was listening to a lot of, um, uh, you know, a podcast that, that's um, called the High Performance Podcast. Um, which okay. is Jake Humphrey from BT does. They've interviewed a lot of, you know, very successful people in business and sport. And one of the questions they always ask about is, the, you know, the guest attitude to failure um, and kind of how they, you know, how they interpret them and how they kind of, what their attitude is towards it and just in terms of what do they get from it? Does it weigh them down? Do they feel they use it to push them forward? And, you know, it's good to hear that people at all different levels, even at that elite level, as you say, you know, Michael Jordan or whoever it is, yeah. that they still use these things to motivate and push themselves forwards. And, and it, in fact, it's perfectly fine to fail sometimes as long as you've tried your hardest, I think. Exactly. I think that's the thing that puts people off and for a lot, for a long, long time, I think I, I didn't put myself out there. I didn't apply for other jobs because it's that in the back of your mind, it's that fear of failure. Mm. Um, I think that kind of inhabits a lot of people from doing stuff. Um, it's probably only the last 10, 10 years or so that kind of the more you put yourself out there, the more you learn about yourself. And it's typically it's not because you're, you're awesome and you succeed in everything because something will trip you up. Um, and then it's how you deal with that and sort of come back a bit stronger. So, yeah, that, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm going to make a note of that podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's I'll really good. Cool. Yeah. I'll send that to you afterwards. Yeah. And, and like you say, it's just that stepping out of your comfort zone sometimes, isn't it? And knowing that if you step out of there, it doesn't work out, then that's okay. It's, you know, you're not all the way back to the drawing board. What have you learned from it? And sometimes just having those interviews where you don't get the job, you actually think, well, actually, that's what the people at this, that's the culture of this company. This is the way they talk. These are the things they're really interested in. And if I got a chance again somewhere similar, I'd be able to prepare better for it as well and things like that. So as we kind of come to the end then, uh, Chris, what, uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of things there about, you know, sort of um, industry specific, um, you know, governing bodies sometimes and, and places that are looking to sort of set, um, you know, that sat down the set standards or, or look mm -hmm. over things or sometimes set apprenticeship standards and things like that. Yeah. Are there any other, um, are there any other resources you would recommend to, to students that were looking to go into kind of your industry or your role? Sometimes people mention websites or blogs, podcasts, sometimes YouTube videos, books they've read websites like like you've mentioned there is there anything else that you, you think is worth looking at um oh, probably wouldn't recommend any books on risk management <laughs> um i've got a stack of them from my uh from the diploma and they're so contradictory at times um it's, it's, it's any wonder i passed to be honest with you um <laughs> it's one of those industries whereby people make a living from making it sound really really complicated um i think one of the things i think i do really well is bringing it back to the principles that anybody can understand. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's any resources along along the lines that do something similar. Um, I mean, like I said, the, the IRM is a starting point. There are free resources on there. Um, there's a couple of consultancy firms, um, so I can provide you the links to those, but there's a Chappelle Consulting. Um, I think she's also written a book. Um, I've not got round to it as yet, but I've heard very, very good things. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, risk management, there's that many different disciplines. It, it would be quite hard to, I think, distill it and, and provide some direct links. Um, I'll have a think about it. Um, and I can probably provide you some um, post this, post this um, recording. Great. Okay. And I mean, you know, in the meantime, we'll link to the IRM stuff below because I know that 
you know, as I mentioned, this is probably the, the first time that some students have even heard about some of these things. So I'm sure some will be interested um, mm -hmm. and, and they might want to have a look into it. So, so that's great. So what I will do at this point then, Chris, is say thanks very much for your time on behalf okay. of the students. Um, we may get some follow-up questions that come as a result of, you know, students watching this. So I may come back to it at some point with a bit of follow-up as well. Yeah, no problem. Cheers, Stephen. Right. Okay. Well, cheers for your time. I'll hopefully speak to you soon. Yep. You too. Thanks a lot. Chris.